up, hold up. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Despite how much I look forward to Halloween every year and all the deliciously spooky movies and video games that come along with it, we're not quite in the Halloween season just yet. But there's no reason why we can't start gearing up for it. So today I'm gonna to be looking at three Game Boy games that are almost Halloween games, but not quite. In a discussion about games to play during the Halloween season, what could be more fitting than the Castlevania series? Answer, Kid Dracula. I can honestly say that I wish Kid Dracula was indeed more Halloween appropriate. But I'm not gonna hold that against the game. I don't believe they were actually trying to make a game that had the same Halloween feels as any of the proper Castlevania games. But Kid Dracula is Castlevania adjacent, so it frequently gets lumped in with games that do a far better job at representing the spooky season. But I'm getting ahead of myself. If you aren't familiar, Kid Dracula originally debuted in 1991 as a Famicom game called Akumaju Special Boku Dracula-kun, which roughly translates to Demon Lord Special I'm Kid Dracula. It was a light-hearted game that very loosely parodied the Castlevania series, similar to how the Parodius series was a parody of Gradius. In fact, Dracula Kuhn even appeared as a playable character in one of the Parodius games. Also like Parodius, Dracula Kuhn was not released in the United States, probably because it was full of that wonderful Japanese humor and weirdness that, despite being extremely popular in America now, definitely wasn't as appreciated back then. However, a lot can change in two years. In 1993, someone apparently decided that America was finally ready for Dracula Coup. And so the Game Boy sequel was brought to the US, simply called Kid Dracula. Now just to get this out of the way, there seems to be some debate over whether Kid Dracula is the literal child form of Dracula, or if he's Dracula's son, who canonically would be Alucard. I'm of the opinion, however, that Kid Dracula is a separate character who exists in whatever parallel Konami universe the Parodius series exists in, and we're probably not meant to think too hard about how he fits into the Castlevania series. And yes, I know there were some tongue-in-cheek references to Kid Dracula in Symphony of the Night, uh, but to me this isn't any real confirmation of any connection between the two series. Uh, but I would look forward to hearing what you guys think in the comments section. The Game Boy game follows the events of the Famicom game. Gallimoth, who was the antagonist of the original game, has returned, and uh, well, Kid Dracula wants to defeat him. The game opens with a very basic recreation of Dracula's castle, complete with classic Castlevania staples like spike traps and rotating gears, and even the stage theme is a playful remix of Beginning from Castlevania 3. Kid Dracula attacks enemies with a fireball that he can shoot in four directions, and holding down the fire button will let him charge up his attack and unleash a super fireball, which of course does extra damage. Enemies defeated with a charge attack will drop coins, which you can use between levels to play minigames to earn extra lives. After every level, Kid Dracula will gain an additional special ability, like a spread shot that will home in on enemies, or the ability to flip gravity and walk on the ceiling. Pressing the select button will let you cycle through your special abilities, but in this first stage, the only special Kid Dracula can do is transform into a bat and fly freely around the screen for a limited time. Now once you get through the opening stage, the game quickly begins to shed any resemblance to the Castlevania series. The second stage is presumably the forest outside the castle, guarded by what appears to be Rick from the Splatterhouse games. After that, you'll go through an amusement park, a flying pirate ship, an elevator into space, a volcano planet straight out of Gradius, and finally some kind of mechanical castle slash robot factory, at the end of which we'll finally face Gallimoth. Now I'll just state the obvious, this is a very good looking game. Character sprites are chunky and well drawn and pop out in stark contrast against the backgrounds. All the stages feel spacious and open without feeling sparse or empty. And in spite of the rather minimalistic stage design, the art style is very strong all throughout the game. I'd normally have a gripe or two about how large the characters appear on the screen, but in this case I never felt like the sprites were too big. There were never any moments where I felt like the zoomed-in perspective was a liability. Granted, this is likely because the game runs so slowly that you usually have plenty of time to react to stage obstacles. Kid Dracula himself moves at a plodding, almost sluggish pace, about on par with the underwater physics in a Sonic the Hedgehog game. And the game's pacing is also kind of broken. 
After you complete each stage, there's often an expository cutscene between Kid Dracula and one of the other characters, as well as a full demonstration of whatever new ability has been unlocked. And then there's a minigame selection screen where you can spend your coins to earn extra lives, which is made even more drawn out because even the process of selecting a minigame is itself a minigame. And at last you're shown the overworld map, which allows you to finally move on to the next stage. Now don't take these complaints to mean that I dislike Kid Dracula or that I wouldn't recommend playing it. Kid Dracula has a great personality and its clean and cartoony presentation is undeniably appealing. But the culmination of all these issues make the game a little boring to play. It's a nice enough game to spend an afternoon with, uh, but not one that I've been motivated to play very often. It's a question for the ages. Is Gremlins a Halloween movie or a Christmas movie? Now to me, I think it's fairly obvious that it's undeniably a Christmas movie, but it is full of scary reptilian monsters who kill people, so I can see how it would work on both levels. Gremlins 2 is not nearly so ambiguous though. It is a straight up comedy, unaffiliated with any holiday, and I absolutely loved this movie when I was a kid. Gremlins 2 received a few video game tie-ins, many of which were for various home computers, but the only ones I was aware of at the time were the game Sunsoft developed for the NES and the Game Boy. Like many of the licensed games Sunsoft developed at the time, the NES and Game Boy versions of Gremlins 2 were completely different games. Whereas the NES version plays a bit like uh, Contra from a top-down perspective, the Game Boy game is a traditional side-scrolling platformer. Despite my love for the movie, the top-down perspective of the NES game was a bit of a turnoff for me as a kid, which was fine because the Game Boy was my system of choice at the time, so that was the version I asked for and eventually received as a Christmas gift. Much like Super Mario Land and the Game Boy version of Batman the video game, Gremlins 2 mimics the character to screen size ratio that you would typically find in an NES game. However, Gizmo Sprite, despite its size, is still extremely well detailed and nicely animated. The game's soundtrack is also quite good, which is pretty much what you'd expect from a Sunsoft game. Although the themes to the first two stages sound more like they belong in Kirby's Dreamland. The final two music tracks are much more what you'd expect from a Gremlins game. There are only four levels in the game, each themed around key locations in the movie, such as the television studio, the science lab, and the lobby of the clamp center. Granted, the stage backgrounds are the only visual difference from one stage to the next. For the most part, all the stages are constructed out of the same, similar looking blocks. The object of every stage is to first locate the pencil, which is your primary weapon for most of the game. The pencil may seem like an unimpressive weapon, but the hitbox from its melee strike is much more generous than you'd expect. You can also collect a radio, which will let you throw a single music note to take out enemies from a distance, and you can also find a toolbox, which will protect you from damage from up to 5 hits, although it will not protect you from spikes. The small character sprites keep the stages from feeling too cramped, and leave you plenty of room to react to and navigate around the various enemies and stage hazards in each of the four levels. At least, that's how it works in theory. A standout character from the movie was the Brain Gremlin, who was a hilarious character because despite his pleasant and intelligent disposition, he was still at heart a gremlin, and thus still drawn to violence and destruction, he was just able to express why he was doing it in a disarmingly eloquent way. Now was that civilized? Fun, but in no sense civilized. If the Brain Gremlin had been able to program a video game, I'm convinced that Gremlins 2 is exactly the kind of game he would have made. In spite of its cute graphics and its upbeat soundtrack, Gremlins 2 is mean. The first level isn't too bad, but once you get into the last 75% of the game, the gloves come off. This is where the levels begin to bristle with spikes, and the platforming becomes unfairly demanding. You'll have to make pixel-perfect jumps under blocks that are just barely high enough to clear. You'll have to keep your footing on fast-moving platforms while simultaneously dodging spikes. You'll have to make increasingly acrobatic jumps around blocks and enemies, and in the final stage, you'll have to blindly navigate a claustrophobic maze of conveyor belts and spikes, while Gizmo himself is completely hidden from view. 
The final boss fight against the Spider Gremlin is a war of attrition where you are constantly taking damage from spiders raining down from the ceiling, and you have to land four perfect hits in a row from a moving position before all your health is depleted. If you don't have full health when you enter this boss fight, you will not win. Oh, and by the way, the final section of the level leading up to this fight is a series of ridiculous jumps over spikes that requires such precision that taking damage is pretty much inevitable. So hopefully you have an extra life or two by the time you get here. Of course, the game isn't nearly as impossible as I probably just made it sound. For one thing, the game gives you unlimited continues. So you can, in theory, brute force your way through the game in a single sitting. And let's be honest, a natural side effect of playing these levels over and over again is that you'll start getting kinda good at them. And you'll also eventually realize that the game gives you enough opportunities to refill your health that you don't really have to work too hard to avoid all damage. You could just run and jump over these spikes. Oh, and by the way, you could also just hang on to the radio power up as you enter that maze, which will make it a little easier to keep track of where you are. Thank you, Nintendo Power. In other words, Gremlins 2 is a pretty typical Sunsoft game. Great graphics, great music, and extremely challenging gameplay. A few years back I did a Halloween video where I dug through my collection and pulled out all these seemingly Halloween-ish games that I had never played. After that video was published I realized that I had somehow forgotten about Beetlejuice on the Game Boy, which would have fit right in with the rest of the games I was talking about in that video. And I think the reason I overlooked that game was because I've never really thought of Beetlejuice the movie as a Halloween movie. I've always loved that movie so much that I grew up watching it all throughout the year, so I'd never really associated it with any one season. It was just a movie I liked that just so happened to be about ghosts in haunted houses. This game is one of two Beetlejuice games developed by Rare. The NES game seems to have been mostly based on the movie. The Game Boy game, on the other hand, was based on the cartoon. Now I've covered quite a few Game Boy games so far, but this is only the second time that I've talked about a Rare game. The first time was Battletoads, which I talked about way back in the very first episode. This is relevant because Beetlejuice appears to have been developed during Rare's Battletoads phase, as the two games seem to share a very similar design philosophy. Although at a glance, Beetlejuice appears to be a pretty typical side-scrolling platformer, the play mechanics differ wildly from one level to the next, much like Battletoads. In the first stage, you have to work your way through the Dietz's house, which is essentially a hub world containing a series of boss battles. You have to enter each of the doors and exercise the ghosts lurking in every room. The second level introduces more of a puzzle element, as you have to figure out how to wrangle the two types of ghosts into either chest or burning candles to get rid of them. And in the third stage, you have to push each of the headstones onto the correctly numbered grave markers, which isn't too mentally taxing, but still requires a bit of exploring and a tiny amount of problem solving to work through. There's also a copious number of mini games sprinkled into the mix, all of which are pretty much just Beetlejuice themed versions of games you're already familiar with, like Whack-A-Mole, Memory, Pipe Dream, and the crowd favorite sliding block picture puzzle, which is every bit as fun here as in every other game it appeared in. Rare seems to have squeezed every type of game that they knew how to make into Beetlejuice. And even though some of them are more fun than others, I appreciate the seemingly endless variety of gameplay styles the game offers up. And then you get to the fourth and fifth levels. And this is where Beetlejuice reminds you, in no uncertain terms, that this is the same developer as Battletoads. Long before Donkey Kong Country made them famous, or rather infamous, the fourth level in Beetlejuice has a couple minecart sequences, which bookend a platforming section that plays an awful lot like the Ice Cave from Battletoads. The fifth stage is another level that would have felt right at home in Battletoads, where you have to guide Beetlejuice on a perpetually bouncing sandworm through an obstacle course of instant death spikes. It's worth mentioning that the first three levels in the game in no way prepare you for the intensity of the fourth and fifth levels. It takes a ton of trial and error to wrap your head around the dodgy collision detection and the awkward movement physics, and you will die a lot. And here's the best part. Beetlejuice gives you no continues. When you run out of lives, you have to start the game over from the very beginning. Now I'll be honest, the second and third levels are pretty cleverly designed, and I actually had fun figuring out how to get through them. 
but once you know the solutions to each of these stages, they simply become a time-consuming and monotonous sequence of steps you have to take just so you can have another opportunity to hopefully get a little bit farther in the minecart stage or the sandworm stage. It's incredibly frustrating. Now to their credit, rares seem to be aware of this, so they allow you to select from the first four stages by entering a secret code at the title screen, but you have to be extremely quick and extremely precise to enter it successfully. If you mess it up, you'll have to completely reboot the game to give it another try. Now even though I wouldn't really consider myself a fan of rare as a developer, I could admit that they are better than most other developers who are typically associated with the licensed games of the 8 and 16-bit era. In the hands of a lesser developer, Beetlejuice would have probably been a generic left-to-right platformer like most trashy Dime a Dozen licensed games. But Rare clearly had fun with this license, and I approve of the variety and imagination they put into this game. It's just too bad Beetlejuice was such a pain in the ass to play. So what do you think? Do you think Kid Dracula is canon with the proper Castlevania series? Are Gremlins and Beetlejuice both part of your annual Halloween movie rotation? Is September too early to even begin thinking about Halloween? Let me know in the comments, and I'll see you next time on The Good, The Bad, and The Game Boy.